Welcome to Hope Church for Wenatchee. We are so glad that you decided to take time to be part of our service today. We are just so encouraged by you actually coming on here and just listening and joining in together with us. And here at Hope Church, we exist to worship, to worship and encounter the living God. And it's not just about us. We are actually here when we come to church. We want to just worship, adore, praise Him. It's not about having a good service, but it's for us, a time for us to just give our all to Jesus. And also, we, we exist to connect, to have fun doing life together as friends, and believe you, we have a lot of fun. <laughs> we have a lot of laughter, we have a lot of joy, and a lot of kids running around. The third one is that we grow. We exist to grow, to fall in love with God's Word and understand His unique giftings in our lives. And the last one, which is so great as well, is we exist to give, to bless our community, to plant churches, and to send missionaries. So here's what you can expect today. We're gonna to start by jumping into the Word of God. So if you have a Bible, just go ahead and grab it. There's also Bibles online on your phones that you can get as well. And you'll need a pen and a notebook because along the way today, there will be opportunities to write down some reflection questions. And at the end of the service today, I hope that you'll be able to answer those questions with those who are seated with you. And after the sermon, we're also taking communion as a church, and we do that every Sunday. So you can go ahead and grab some juice or wine, um, crackers, bread, basically anything that you can put into your mouth that we are just going to remember what God has done for us on the cross. And also, I'd like to encourage you to have a time of worship in your home. Um, if you have a musician, have them lead you in a time of worship. But if you don't, just sing as loudly as you can and just make a joyful noise to the Lord. We, if you don't have a musician or any way to do that, we've provided a worship link right here on our page. But before we begin, let's pray over our time together. Lord, we thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. And right now, we just ask that you would bless our time, bless the worship, bless the word. Lord, And just everything that we do today, you would be exalted and you would be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's prepare our hearts to hear a word from God today. Good morning, Hope Church for Wenatchee. Grab your Bibles, and we are going to go back into the Gospel of John. And today, we have a great chapter to work through together, John chapter 11. It's the story of Jesus and, uh, and the man Lazarus, Jesus resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. And so let's jump in, uh, starting in verse 1, and we're going to just read right through the whole chapter. Here we go. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick, so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them uh, plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. 
Thomas, named the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people who had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, The teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were, out, who were standing nearby said, See how much he loved him. But some said, This man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a, uh, with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave cloths, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happening. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, said, You don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He did not say this on his own. As high priest at that time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation, and not only for the nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. As a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among the people and left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness to the village of Ephraim and stayed there with his disciples. It was now almost time for the Jewish Passover celebration, and many people from all over the country arrived in Jerusalem several days early so that they could go through the purification ceremony before the Passover began. They kept looking for Jesus, but as they stood around in the temple, they said to each other, What do you think? He won't come here for Passover, will he? Meanwhile, the leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus 
must report it immediately so that they could arrest him. Dun, dun, dun. Well, let's pray and jump in. Jesus, thank you so much for this passage. And Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us through your word. Um, God, I, we just, we're asking that you would uh, just open the eyes of our heart to see Jesus like we've never seen him before. God, we're asking that you would, uh, you would just really show us today how you have conquered death and that it would be something that is uh, our great source of hope, a foundation that nothing in life can ever shake. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I don't know if you are a Seahawk fan like myself or not. Um, if you are, you will uh, you'll probably fully understand what I'm about to share. Um, and then if you're not, maybe this will help you understand your, your, your fellow brothers and sisters who are Seahawk fans, okay? So um, here's what I want to I want to share with you is um, eight years ago, the Seahawks beat the Denver Broncos. It's hard to believe that it's been that long. Uh, time goes really fast, but that was a, an absolutely life-changing experience for all of us who have been Seahawks fans for many years. And here's why, here's why, is that as a Seahawks fan, we had grown very accustomed to always losing, right? Uh, we had worked so hard for so many years just to even get to the Super Bowl, and then, and then we lost. Right, we'd we'd come so close so many times, gotten to some conference championships, and then we finally got to the Super Bowl and just had our hearts completely crushed. And so this time, 2014, right? You guys remember it well. If you were there, if you're a Seahawks fan, we finally beat the 49ers, right? All you 49er fans, uh, you know, you just don't understand the the pain and grief of being a Seahawks fan. You're so used to always winning, right? Uh, in fact, the last two times that you guys lost the Super Bowl, it's been the, like this this total reality check that life doesn't always go your way, right? Like we just we had never experienced what it must feel like to be. A champion and so so we finally meet the 49ers we go to the Super Bowl and I don't know if you remember this but that that Super Bowl opens and I just remember being on pins and needles and just just waiting for waiting for something bad to happen and and then and then everything started going our way right from the opening snap that goes over Peyton Manning's head and and then we recover it for a, a safety from from that to then uh, the 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 defense just was so uh, just so dominating to then uh, right going into the into the second half we returned the second half kickoff for a for a touchdown like there began to all of a sudden be this growing realization oh my gosh, we are about to be the champions. Like, and, and we have literally been living off of that for like the last eight years, right? And we're, it looks like we're gonna have to live off of that, that, that for a number of more years based on where things are going right now. But it was just this unbelievable feeling that we had never experienced. We were always only ever used to losing. And so it is when it comes to uh, this moment in time, right? Jesus shows up, Lazarus has, has died, and this feeling that, oh, death has won again, right? Like if you think about it, there, if you look all the way back through history, uh, through recorded biblical history, there's maybe, maybe three people that, 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 that seem to have cheated death, right? If you know your Old Testament, well, uh, you know about Enoch, who says it walked with the Lord until one day he wasn't. Uh, you know about Moses, we're, we're, we're not sure what happened with Moses, but he's, he shows up at the Mount of Transfiguration later on, so some people uh, suppose that maybe he just kind of left the presence of earth and stepped into the presence of God. And then we have, and then we have Elijah that the, the biblical uh, history records was caught up in a chariot. So three people, right? Three to millions and, and tens, hundreds of millions, maybe a billion people. I, who, who knows at that point in history how many people had, had lived and died, right? That 
death had a long undefeated history. Benjamin Franklin said this, his famous quote, uh, in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. So in that context, Jesus shows up. And, and this, this chapter actually becomes the pivotal chapter of the entire book of John, of the entire Gospel of John. Chapter 11 is the last of the seven signs of who Jesus is. Jesus is showing through, through miracles and many different miracles, turning water into wine, healing the blind man, healing the lame man, walking on water, uh, turning just a few bread, pieces of bread and fish into a feast that feeds 5,000 people, right? All these signs were pointing to who Jesus was, that Jesus was not an ordinary man. Jesus was the Messiah that they were waiting for. Jesus had been sent from God. Jesus was the word that had become flesh. All these things that John has claimed about Jesus, Jesus has been showing signs that he is indeed this man that they've been waiting for. And then John chapter 11 is the culminating sign. It's the, it's the greatest sign of them all. It's the, the seventh sign. And that seven means something in the gospel of John. It's the sign of completion, right? Just like there were seven days of creation. So there, these seven signs fully complete this picture of who Jesus is. And after this sign, we're going to see that, that this story really begins to pivot now towards the last couple of days of Jesus's life. We, the, from John chapter 12 uh, through to the end, we see the, uh, the, the week of the crucifixion and then the resurrection. And so this, this, uh, this chapter, chapter 11, is really a, a central part of this account of who Jesus is. And the big idea that we're going to talk about today is simply this, that Jesus has conquered death. Jesus has power over death. Now, let me give you just a couple of interesting uh, church history um, items about Lazarus and about who he was. Um, it says here in, in the Gospel of John that he was from the town of Bethany. And modern day Bethany is the town, it's the Palestinian town or neighborhood, it's kind of a neighborhood of Jerusalem, called El Azariah, okay, El, El Azariah, which translated means the place of Lazarus. Isn't that so cool? So right down to the present time, the, the town that, were, that was called Bethany now is known as the place of Lazarus. It was such a profound miracle that it actually has changed that name and, and that carries to our present time. Now, there's, uh, there's some disagreement between the Eastern Orthodox uh, tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition on where Lazarus goes after Jesus' death and resurrection, okay? Uh, G Lazarus is resurrected from the grave, but the thing that they both share in common is that he goes into full-time ministry. He becomes a pastor in the early church and then lives out the rest of his life serving the church as, as, a, as a pastor, as, a, as one of the bishops of the early church. Okay, so let's jump into chapter 11, and we're going to go first to verse 5, and it says this, So although Jesus loved Martha... Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, isn't this interesting, right? They've sent, uh, they've sent messengers to tell Jesus, your friend Lazarus is dying. Come quickly. We need you, right? Um, they're, they're crying out to Jesus, come heal your friend Lazarus. And yet Jesus waits. And so I just want to ask this question as you, you sit with this, with this passage of Scripture. Do you trust the sovereignty and wisdom of God? Do you trust the sovereignty and wisdom of God? There's going to be many mysteries in your life as you follow Jesus. Things that happen that you just don't understand. Why did it happen that way? Some of them you will get answers for. You'll look back over the course of your life and be like, wow, I'm so thankful that even though it was, it was hard at that time that, that the Lord took us through 
through this, through, through this season. But there's going to be others that you will, you will go to your grave not understanding why it was that it, things happened a certain way. But as followers of Jesus, here's what we can know, is that we can trust every mystery of our life to the gracious, loving, wise hand of God. Now, the pain and sorrow of your life will often come to you and it will try to lie to you about the character of God. It'll, it'll point out to the, 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 that pain and sorrow and it'll say things like, see, what kind of a God would allow something like that? You can't trust him. That's always at the core of, of that lie. You can't trust God. I remember a, a time in, uh, in for, for Katie and I, that was very, very challenging. Very, there, were, there was just a number of things that had happened back to back to back. Um, we had gone through uh, a financial significant downturn um, and things were very difficult financially. Um, we had lost a home. Um, and then Katie had gone through some some real physical challenges, and then she was uh, she was pregnant with our with our third uh, our third child Asher, and the doctors had found some abnormalities um, and were warning us that you know th things might uh, go very badly with this pregnancy, and it was just one of those seasons where it just felt like one thing after another after another, and we were really crying out to God and. And, and just honestly, just really struggling with trusting him. And I remember um, we were hosting a guest ministry in our, in our home. Uh, her name was uh, Linda and just a wonderful, wonderful woman of God. And um, I was just kind of sharing with her some of the, the heartache that we were, we were dealing with. And I, I told her this, I said, look, I know God is a, a, a good God. I just don't know if he's very nice. And she laughed, was, she was very gracious. But then she said, and I'm so grateful she said this, she was very pastoral in that moment. She said, hey, David, you really need to, you need to, you need to wrestle with this. This is, this is important for you to not just let go. This is, we're, this is speaking to the character of who God is. You need to get, you need to spend some time with the Lord and allow him to heal that part of your heart that's really questioning him and, and struggling to trust him. And it was, it was kind of a wake up call, honestly, because uh, I had sort of given myself permission to be a little bit jaded. I felt very authentic, very real. I don't know about, you know, it, and, and it was a little bit of this wake up call of, hey, actually that's not okay for you just to hang out in that place. It's okay for you to be real about what's going on, but don't stay there. And so what it led me into was a season of just really uh, where I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you need to come hang out with me some more and just get to re-know me. And so I would spend many of my lunch breaks just taking long walks with the Lord. It was, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a really beautiful uh, forested park that was real close to the office that I was working at. And so I would just go on walks. I would actually go to coffee shops. I called it just having coffee with Jesus where I just sit down and just allow his word to really speak to me. And through that time, can I just tell you, the Lord began to really heal my heart. And it wasn't like everything turned around overnight. Everything didn't just all of a sudden get better. But what began to happen was that my heart began to be healed and began to trust the Lord again. And this is what, this is what Jesus is doing in this moment. Is he, even though he's not answering Mary and Martha's prayer like they want him to, they, he's, not, he's not showing up to heal Lazarus before he dies, he tells them, you're going to see the glory of God revealed through this situation. And I promise you, if you will trust God with the mysteries of your heart, whether it's on this side of the grave or that side of the grave, you will see the glory of God revealed with your situations, with your pain and sorrow that you're walking through, with the questions that you have in your life. You can trust God with your life. So here's the first reflection question I want you to think about. Reflection question number one is this. 
What areas of your life do you struggle the most to trust God with? What areas of your life do you struggle the most to trust God with? Go ahead and take a minute and write down your thoughts. Okay, let's jump down to verse 11, and uh, Jesus says this. He says, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. Kind of an interesting <coughs> uh, phrase, and it's become actually a, a, a common Christian um, phrase or wording for death. But prior to Jesus, it wasn't common. In fact, the disciples are confused by it, right? They're like, well, if, it, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Let's let him sleep some more, right? And, and Jesus tells them, look, Lazarus has died. But I want us to actually just think about that phrase for a moment because it, it really gets us to begin to wrestle with and think about what death is. For the believer, death is simply going to be like falling asleep. We'll, we'll enter our eternal rest. And at a time that only the Lord knows, he will come and he'll awaken our, our earthly bodies and call us up into a resurrected new body, just like his own resurrected body. This is what, this is what the Bible promises us. For the believer, death comes simply as a, as a welcome rest from, from toil, from sickness, from the pain of the world. Uh, some of the early Christians did uh, uh, some things that you and I might think of being a little bit morbid or a little bit strange, but um, they, they really, um, they were really just aware of and, and felt like it was actually healthy for their soul to be aware of how fleeting this life really is and how, how momentary and temporary this life is. And so um, one of the practices that was fairly common in, in early monasteries is they would actually take the, the skull of some of the, their, their brothers or sisters that had, had died before them, and they would have it sitting there in their room. And as they're, as they're sitting there and reading scripture and, and praying, they would actually be reminded that, you know, brother so-and-so was here just not so long ago, and now he's a skull. Or uh, another tradition that is still carried out to this day in, among uh, some monastic traditions is at the monastery, 
they will actually they have the they have the the cemetery area where all all the the monks that have ministered there uh, are buried and then they will actually dig the next grave and there'll be an open grave there that they walk past every day on their way to to, to their times of prayer and worship and it's just a reminder again that it's not long before we enter our eternal rest as well and so i just i want us to um i want to challenge us to have a a, a, a strong theology, a biblical theology of death. I think it's actually, again, it's, it's really healthy and good for our soul. C.S. Lewis says this. I love this quote. You may have heard this quote before. He says, If I find in myself desires which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And again, this is one of the things that death reminds us of, right? We were made for another world. And so let me take just a few minutes together here, and let's actually talk through some of the theology of death, okay? I want to share three points on the theology of death and what the Bible says about death. Number one is this, is that for the believer to die is simply to enter into rest from the labor, the strife, sorrow, and pain of this life. For the believer to die, death is rest from the labors, strife, sorrow, and pain of this life. Revelations 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their, their deeds follow them. Revelations 21.4, He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And so this idea of entering into our rest is one of, the, one of the central themes that the Bible talks about when the, when the believer passes from this life into the next. Okay, the next one, number two, is this, is that for the believer to die is to be with Christ. Okay, this is one of the major themes that you see over and over again through the New Testament. Philippians 1, 21 through 23, Paul writes, For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between these two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8 says this, For we know that when this earthly tent that we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing, for we will put on heavenly bodies. Uh, we will not be spirits without bodies. We will live in these earthly bodies. Uh, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this and, has guarantee, and as a guarantee has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. So just let that sink into your soul is that when that day comes, as it comes for us all, uh, except for the generation that will be alive at the second coming of Christ, every one of us, There'll be that moment when we, we come to the end of this, this life, right? When just like the, the monks are remembering, we will enter that grave. But at that moment, 
at that very moment, you will be with Christ. Okay, number three is this, is that the believer will be resurrected from the dead, just like Lazarus, and will meet Christ together with all those who are living at the day of his resurrection. And there's a number of scriptures in regards to this. First Corinthians, or sorry, Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, okay, or who have died, that you might not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so Jesus, God, uh, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the, this is the future. This is what God is going to do. And then one last passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Again, we shall not all die is what it's saying. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? So these are the things that the Bible teaches us about death. Jesus has conquered the power of death. All right, let's go back to John 11 now. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother's my brother would not have died. Can you hear the sorrow and anguish in her voice? She's probably saying this through tears. Jesus, if only you had been here. Some of us are hanging on to a few if onlys in our life. Personal regrets, shame, tragedies from our past sins that you've committed or have been committed against you, disappointments in our life. And the thing I want to remind you about this morning is that our God is the God who redeems our if-onlys. And so whatever, whatever if-only you, you wrestle with, or maybe you have a long list of if-onlys, can I just can I just speak to your heart this morning and, and challenge you? Say, bring those all to Jesus right now. Every single one of them. Just allow Jesus to, to, to see your list. Just lay it before him. Just surrender it to him. All your if-onlys. You will be amazed at the things that he's able to redeem. Um, let me share just one, one story with you. Uh, right, after, right after graduating from college, I had the privilege of being a part of a, uh, a brand new startup business. And it was very exciting and, and um, just a really neat thing that we got to build. I was uh, just part of this really, the, the, the original group that, that was building this business. And, and we saw it grow and mature and become something very significant. Uh, in our community down in Portland. And, and we were really excited for the future, right? We were creating plans for, you know, taking it national and, and all the things that you do with a startup.com business, right? And, um, and then um, we were in the process of, of, of looking at the possibility of, of selling the business and being able to 
uh, take some of those, some of those, uh, those, those that profit as uh, out of the business, and then and then again taking it to the next scale. And in that season, we made the decision not to do that, and instead trying try to do it on our own. And right after that is when the Great Recession hit, and all of all of the. Uh, all of the, the the financial turmoil that resulted from that, and then there were some things within the industry that ended up really impacting us in, in a negative way. And within just a very short period of time, the 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 value that uh, that we had thought we had in the business was gone very very quickly. And I remember wrestling with with that, and and hearing our the, our owners saying, you know, if only I had moved forward with that if only i had done that differently and we had we had sold instead of hanging on to it ourselves but for for katie and i we've talked about this is that had things worked out the way that we had wanted to if we'd been able to 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 fulfill that dream at that time i don't think probably we would have ended up moving to central Washington. Things would have probably gone a different direction with us. And so in for us, when we look back on that, we're so grateful for all of that, that heartache and loss and the hard things that we went through, the, the things that the Holy Spirit did in our lives, the, the realigning of priorities, and then and then even the fact that because because we were just really uh, surrendered to the Lord in a, in a new way. We were open to possibilities that I don't think we would have been open to otherwise. And, and so we were very willing to, as the Lord called us to come to Central Washington, we were willing to take that step. And so the Lord redeemed that in ways that we just could have never imagined. He then opened other doors here in Central Washington that we could have never predicted. And, and you just don't know what God will do. What he calls you and I to do is simply bring it to him, to surrender it to him. Verse 25, let's go on. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? So this morning, I want you to just, just close your eyes right now. Just allow Jesus to say these words over your heart, over your spirit right now. Just, just let them go deep, deep into your soul, okay? I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection. Just let that sit in your, in your heart right now. Jesus is the life. Anyone, man or woman, rich or poor, young or old, every ethnic background, no matter what you have done in the past. It doesn't matter what you may have uh, thought was so great in your past. It might be a whole list of regrets and things that you know you've done wrong. Anyone who believes in him will live even after you die. You will never die. Just let that truth just soak into your heart, into your spirit. Let it just permeate every part of your mind. You will never die if you believe in Jesus. Now, if you're wrestling with this, this is a, this is a moment of invitation right now. Jesus is inviting you. The doors are wide open. He says, anyone, anyone, it, there's no exclusive uh, 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 exclusivity to his claim here. He says, anyone who believes will receive life. You will never, ever die. And then he says, do you believe this? And so I just want to just ask you that question this morning. Do you believe this? Now go down to verse 33. 
says, when Jesus saw her weeping, this is now, this is Mary, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and saw the others wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Now, uh, I, I, I really, based on the context and, and how Jesus responds, I don't believe that he was, he's not angry with Mary. He's angry at the, at the sorrow and pain that death has caused. And I just want you to know that this is who our God is, right? It's so easy to get angry at God when, when sorrow, when death, when, when, when disappointments hit our life. But can I just tell you that your God is angry too, <laughs> right? It's the result of sin and death that brings the sorrow and destruction into our life. And here Jesus is witnessing it. It says he's angry. He's going to do something about it. it. He gets, it, it says it again, he, it says that he's angry, and so he goes up to the tomb. He's about to do something about it. And so this is with God that, 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 that he will defeat death and sin. There's an anger, there's a justice that is within him saying, this is not right. This will not stand. I will bring this to an end. Jesus will defeat death. There is coming that point. It doesn't matter what the what past history has shown, a million, a billion to three to four to five, whatever the record is, right? There's going to come a moment when death will be defeated utterly, totally, completely for all time. Jesus, it, it angers him what, what sin and death has done to this world, to you and to my life. Verse 37 but some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Now, I want you to notice, Jesus actually doesn't rebuke them for this response. This is a very real response, right? This is, this is I'm sure you at times have felt this. God, I know that you have the power to do this. I've seen you do it in the past. I've seen you do it for other people. I, I've seen it through scripture. Why, God, why is it that you haven't moved in this area? So this is a very, just a very real, very human response. And again, don't be afraid to, to be honest before the Lord with those things, with those sorrows, with those questions. He can handle it, right? It doesn't scare him. Trust those questions to him. Surrender those questions to him. Verse 39, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. <laughs> and I love this. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Right? Lazarus is very, very dead. The, the King James Version says it best. It says it like this. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> you know, some of us are afraid to let Jesus into certain parts of our, our, our heart and our, our lives. And we're like, Lord, don't open that up. It stinketh. And, and so I just want you to, I just want to challenge you that if, if God, if God wants to, to move on a certain area, if God's calling you to something, trust him with it, right? Allow him to open those rooms, allow him to go in to bring healing and miracle power into the areas of your life that you just thought were so dead that nothing could ever touch because this is who our God is. He's the God of resurrection. He's the God of redemption. You can trust him. And so then that moment when Jesus is standing over the, standing over the, the tomb and he yells down into it, he says this, Lazarus, come out. And I just want to remind you that this is, it, it, this is, this is a foreshadowing, right? This is, this is one example of what Jesus is going to do for every single one of you who put your hope and faith in Jesus. Just like he said to Lazarus in that moment, he comes and stands at the edge of the tomb. He yells, Lazarus, come out and the dead man arises and comes, comes out. So it is when, when Jesus comes, just like we read a little bit ago in that passage in, in Thessalonians, which says, when the trumpet blasts and the archangel declares, 
over it with a loud blast and the dead will rise. It, it, Jesus will come to the edge of every single one of our graves and he'll yell down, he'll yell your name and say, come out of that grave. This is what will take place because Jesus has conquered death. Jesus is more powerful than death. Now, the end of this story is that this miracle has the, 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 the story of this miracle has spread all over that region and it's freaking out the religious leaders. They're, they're saying, we've got to put a stop to this. Jesus is, is clearly showing by his miracle powers that he has power and authority and everyone, if this keeps going on, everyone is going to believe in him. And, and Caiaphas, who was the high priest, said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. Now, the amazing thing is John actually takes this and captures this and says, actually, this is a prophetic declaration about what Jesus is about to do. Verse 51, he did not say this on his own. As high priest at that time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation. And not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. And so as we get ready now to come to communion, this is what the communion table is all about. Right? The communion table is about the, the Lamb of God who has sacrificed himself for us all, for the entire nation of Israel, and like John says, for all the children of God scattered all across the entire world, for you and for me. Jesus was willing to lay his life down so that you could be saved, so that you, by, by his death, by taking on the punishment for sin, that was the thing that had to happen in order for death to, to release, be, for, 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 for death to release its power, because, because death gained entrance into the, this world because of sin. So sin had to be dealt with. And Jesus, by his sacrifice, deals with the sin. He provides the, the theological word is propitiation for the sin. He provides a, a sacrifice for the sin so that the sin is atoned for. And so now death has lost its claim over you and over me. And that's what we celebrate at the communion table. This is why we remember each week we come to the communion table and we take that bread that represents the broken body of Jesus and we take the cup. And, and, and as we do that, we are remembering this sacrifice that Jesus has done for us. So we're going to get ready to do that in just a, a moment now. Before we do, though, I want you to take just a minute and I want you to uh, think about the, the second reflection question and, and write down your thoughts. So go ahead and take, take just a minute and write your thoughts down.
All right, now before we go to the communion table, I wanna take just a moment and um, if you have never made the decision to become a follower of Jesus, to put your faith and trust in him, to trust him with your life, and to trust him like we talked about today, with your death. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in him will never die. And so if you want today to be that day that you make that confession of faith, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to pray with you right now. Romans 10, in uh, Romans chapter 10, it says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. And so bow your head and close your eyes and let me pray with you right now. Jesus, today I make the decision to put my faith and trust in you. Jesus, I believe you are who you said you were. You are the Messiah that was promised for all those years. You are the Son of God. You are, you are the, the sacrifice on that cross that takes away my sin. And you have really been resurrected to life again. You are alive, really, truly alive. And you will come one day and resurrect my body to live with you forever and ever. God, I believe that. I give you my life. I surrender to you, Lord. I say, I trust you. I trust you with my past. I trust you with my present. And I trust you with my future. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's get ready to take communion together now. Well, we've come to the part of the service where we're going to take communion together. And um, I'd just like to read a scripture in Colossians 2, um, verses 13 through 15. And it says, You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So when we take communion, we're remembering, okay, God has nailed all of the charges all of our sin, all of our shame, everything that we have done wrong to the cross. When he died there and he shed his blood, that is exactly what happened. So we do not have to feel any shame and any guilt. And also it says that he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, which means we have no fear. <laughs> they have no power against us. There is nothing that they can do against us because he has disarmed them. And I just love that in God's blood, we have the forgiveness, right? And we, have, we are now made alive through what he has done on the cross. And so I want you to just really take that in as we pray, as Christina is gonna um, pray over the juice and then, or excuse me, the bread, and I'm gonna pray over the juice. Just remember that, that this is what God has done for you. If you need a healing, if you need a victory, if you need freedom in any area, this is when we drink the juice. This is not like a magic formula or anything, but we are remembering and we are claiming the victory that God has given us on the cross. So Christina, take it away. All right. <laughs> First Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 26. Recount for us Jesus' words on the night before he was betrayed. He took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said take and eat this is my body which is given for you the ultimate sacrifice for us yeah. what a blessing mm -hmm. what a blessing so please take the bread that you have and let's pray over it and then we'll eat it together Father God, thank you for your son. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. 
we are made alive yes. because of your sacrifice, because your body was broken for us. It is an honor to celebrate this together, mm -hmm. to take this cracker, this bread that signifies your body and to eat it together, to have it become a part of us, to remind us yes. of your sacrifice and your love for us. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we take this bread together. And again, we pray in your name, Jesus. Thank you so much. Let's eat together. Okay, I'm going to continue reading in 1 Corinthians 11 and continue on in um, verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And that's what we want to do is announce his death and remember everything that he has done for us and remember the new covenant that he has, has welcomed us into his family. We are now God's children. We are his heirs. Everything that he has is for us. And this happened through Jesus' blood on the cross. So I'm gonna pray right now. Lord, I thank you for your blood that was shed. Lord, your body was broken so that we could have healing. Lord, your blood was shed so that we could have freedom. Lord, and that we could be part of your family, your children, Lord, your anointed ones, Lord. Lord, I just ask that, I just, I don't ask, I just thank you right now for the blessings, Lord, and for the love, so much love that you have just showered upon us as your children. And as we drink this today, Lord, we just remember and we say thank you. Thank you so much for what you have done on the cross. Amen. Let's drink together. Before we close today, I want to take a moment and say thank you to those who have partnered with us financially. There are so many great things that are happening in the Valley, and we are so glad to be partnering with people. I just want to share a little bit. Recently, we've been able to do some yard work at the Haven of Hope. We've also done meals at the Wenatchee Rescue Mission. We have a new tab on our app that is the prayer wall. So if you need prayer for any, any area in your life, anything at all, you can go over to our Hope Church Wenatchee app and you'll be able to um, just post your prayer and just know that there are people in Hope Church who are praying for you and for that need. So we've also um, are starting a new outreach as well um, next week, I believe. We're just going to go for a couple months and we're actually going to have kind of some sort of drive through prayer and healing thing going on in the valley. So if you are here and if you um, need prayer or you need healing or anything like that, we would love to be able to pray for you and to just minister to you, just minister the love of God. So those are just a few things that, are, that we're doing right now and it's your finances that have been able to support us and that is why we were able to do these things in the valley. So if, for those of you who haven't given financially yet, we just want to share there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, you can give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. You can give online at our website, hopechurchwenatchee.com, or through our app, which I just talked about. Or you can mail your check to 14 North Wenatchee Avenue, Wenatchee, Washington, 98801. So as I was thinking about giving today and just what that means in my life, I have just seen God do amazing, amazing things in my life, um, just from his abundance. You know, it says in John 1, verse 16, I believe, it says, from his abundance, we have received one gracious blessing after another. And that is so true, amen? We have a wonderful God who has more than we can ever need. And so I just want to today just encourage you to give with a grateful heart and that he has done so much for us and from his abundance we have all that we need and he just continues to bless us over and over again. So let's pray today, shall we? Lord, as we give in today's offering, we just want to say thank you. We just want to be 
just open our hearts and say, Lord, we are so grateful for what you have given us, for what you have um, poured into our lives, for the freedom, for the joy, for the um, financial blessings that you have given us. And God, I just pray right now, if there's anybody watching that needs a miracle in their finances, Lord, I just ask that as it says in your word, from your abundance, we have received one gracious blessing after another. We ask that you would pour out your blessings upon each person listening today. Thank you that you hear us, that you see us, and that you are a God of blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we thank you so much for your generosity because it is definitely making a difference in so many lives here in the valley. We want to thank you for joining us today. We pray that you have been blessed and encouraged by this message. And we just ask that you would go and have a wonderful week filled with the abundance and the blessing of our Heavenly Father. We'll see you next time.